and uh, welcome to this uh, wonderful experiment. Uh, I certainly know of you by reputation, and um, it's the hope of SIU to integrate uh, its offerings, uh, the frontiers together with global challenges, with the computing uh, work, etc. cetera. Um, and so we're uh, going to be attracting and have attracted some very interesting people that I hope will be of intrigue to you. But you certainly are intriguing to us <laughs> in the context of the expertise that you have, your extraordinary expertise, which makes you a prime suspect and candidate uh, to actually uh, be lured into our uh, corner of the world, uh, given your expertise in the region. Um, we're going to be extraordinarily eclectic. Uh, Cody, who is my wonderful teaching assistant, uh, who's recently been at the University of Cambridge, uh, um, is uh, going to be uh, a major factor in this integration. And I uh, recently graduated the University of Cambridge. Uh, he is a significant figure in what we will be doing here as well. Uh, Cody, I'm wondering uh, if you will introduce yourself, but first, if you would throw into the mix uh, the um, Wikipedia or identification for David Guston, uh, for Shai Lander and Professor Dirks to get a sense of one of the people that we have just secured for later on in the semester who speaks to the broad eclecticism of uh, what we hope to present. But, uh, and, and Cody if, as well, if you will throw into the chat uh, Professor Jack Goldstone uh, to give Professor Dirks a sense of, and, uh, of where we're going. Uh, we have a very broad mandate <clears throat> and uh, we'll be doing parallel things with the obvious uh, beyond thinking about uh, classic strategic issues um, military concerns, nuclear, um, the challenges facing India, both from India and China. Uh, we'll be looking very seriously at the environment. But uh, Jack Goldstone really has an, an important way to introduce a new element to this, which is his pioneering work on demographics. Uh, but David Guston, who's appearing in your shop here, uh, sits with me on the board of uh, Pugwash, uh, the U.S. Uh, chapter of Pugwash, uh, the Nobel Prize winning organization dedicated to thinking about the fusion between ethics, science, technology, uh, proliferation, environmental issues. So, uh, once again, I wanted to welcome all of you uh, wonderful students to this uh, uh, sort of the first kickoff uh, colloquium of, of your college life. Uh, uh, and and I, I can't think of a better person to kick that off than Professor Nicholas Dirks. Um, you know, uh, uh, an internet, I mean, basically a historian and anthropologist of international renown. Uh, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I'm just trying to think of this, if there's any part of academic work, really intellectual work that he's not touched upon in one way or the other. Um, uh, he, he is the quintessential uh, uh, person you would think about when you think about a liberal education, uh, the study of history and anthropology. Uh, and I'm happy to say that his study was also uh, uh, conducted uh, in uh, my ancestral village in southern India. And uh, he speaks uh, fluent Tamil. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, and since actually his uh, PhD thesis, uh, you know, finding a, a first academic job at Caltech, you know, uh, where he interacted with, uh, you know, the Nobel Prizes in, 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 in the sciences. And what's intrigued me was, uh, you know, what he's mentioned to me was that th those conversations for him sort of sparked the uh, uh, sort of the thought that, look, I mean, it's perhaps the uh, humanities and the sciences are not that far apart. I mean, in fact, from my recollection of my conversation with uh, Professor Dirks, those Nobel Prize winners really wanted to know more about his work and about India. Uh, and, and I think, you know, since then he's, he's not looked back. Uh, dean at Columbia, professor at Columbia, chancellor at the very reputed University of California, Berkeley, uh, 
and now to sort of you know when you thought there was no more place to rise or no further place to rise uh here he is at the helm of the uh new york academy of sciences uh you know and and i just wanted to mention to 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 you uh, about this academy uh it's it's done cutting edge uh research uh work in in the sciences since 1817 when it was first established uh uh and and basically as president of the new york academy of sciences he has a board uh, advising uh him and if you look at that board uh it has i, I mean i don't know my my count at least 30 nobel prize winners uh you know so it's basically got the who's who in science it's got the who's who in industry uh and one of the most uh you know very cherished uh uh you know scientific and perhaps the oldest one of the oldest scientific organizations in the united states uh it's a real pleasure uh to invite him uh to our uh first colloquium uh thank you all for uh the invitation to be uh part of this opening uh, uh seminar uh the truth is that uh i've been hearing about sai university now for some time and you may know uh that an old friend of mine pramath sinha was uh, was someone who uh, spoke to me about this some years ago both uh before the pandemic and before the recruitment of uh, professor barucha to be the vice chancellor so i'm delighted to be uh, uh witnessing now the uh, inaugural class and uh, and this great adventure and journey uh upon which you are now embarking uh and uh, very happy to be part of it So what um what Shailender had asked me to uh to do uh today was to talk a little bit about the relationship between the humanities and the sciences uh which is something I've written a bit about in my capacity as the president of the New York Academy of Sciences. Uh but I thought I would do this uh uh because this is after all the first class you're having uh I thought I would do it in part through walking uh you students through some of the journey that I've taken uh since in fact I took a similar kind of class that you're taking now many years ago when I was a first year student in college uh at a small college in uh in 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 the northeast of America I took a course and it was a wonderful opportunity for me on the question of free will and necessity Uh, and it was really about whether or not we as human beings have some degree of freedom in how we make choices about how we behave in the world uh or whether we're determined by biological or other kinds of factors that dictate the way in which we respond to our environment and uh and 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 effectively create the conditions under which we then proceed to act uh with much less uh, free choice than we think we have Uh, the course was taught by two professors it was taught by a philosopher of religion on the one side and a behavioral psychologist on the other uh and uh, it was a debate and i loved the course because i for the first time saw two very very smart and very knowledgeable people uh talking to each other but coming from very different premises very different backgrounds and disagreeing about virtually everything even though uh both of them had logic rigor rationality in the way in which they made their arguments now in my case i picked the side of the philosopher uh and um and yet of course even in the course of that course even while i was taking the course i wondered you know was this a free choice <clears throat> or was the fact that my father was a philosopher that i had a religious background and so on and so forth the reason i chose uh, uh that side of the debate uh in any event uh the 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 course opened up some of the really big questions but they're questions that bridge the humanities and the sciences and in a way i start with this course that i took because i learned at that point that even though there were some fundamental disagreements there were many more similarities than there were differences now in that particular case uh and jumshed uh you in particular will recognize this because uh, you know the the genealogy of the professor i had in psychology he was a student of bf skinner uh a a a, a path breaking behavioral psychologist who taught for many years at harvard uh and yet who had the notion uh, basically that uh that that we behave uh 
in ways that we are reinforced to behave, that if we are given some kind of incentive and there are conditions that make it a positive good for us to do something in a particular way, that's the way we uh, that's the way we'll go. And uh, he even uh, worked a lot with animals and he worked in particular with pigeons who he had trained to uh, devise a kind of early version of a drone weapon by, uh, by, 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 by taking when they got grain uh, and pecking on it uh, a, a, a weapon that could be guided into, uh, into enemy territory without risking human, uh, human life. <clears throat> now, uh, I thought this was a silly thing to take a human being and all the complex ethical questions that go into our own sense of ourselves and our beliefs about morality, ethics, and the like, uh, and reduce it to that of a pigeon. But he had all kinds of ways in which he took even that very narrow behavioral kind of uh, view of the world and attempted to build it into the conditions under which you could have uh, a community living together and living the good life. And he even wrote a book that was called Walden II after Walden I, uh, written by Thoreau, which was a kind of early Utop American utopian effort to, uh, to talk about what one needs for the good life, which is the kind of classic idea that goes all the way back to Aristotle uh, uh, and fundamental to uh, both an individual and a community approach to trying to understand what really life is all about and certainly what is a good life all about. Now, in my own career, uh, I veered away from science uh, when I was in college and I studied the humanities and social science. I took interdisciplinary programs. And so I did a lot of different courses and perhaps uh, Shailender, that's why uh, I have so many different kinds of interests. You could say uh, that I could never decide uh, uh, fully what I wanted to focus on. Uh, but um, uh, but as, I, as I studied uh, the humanities, uh, I was also, uh, at a time in American history when there were lots of concerns about, uh, about the use of the potential use of nuclear weapons, uh, the possibility of nuclear war. That's, I grew up with a great fear of that. Uh, it was the time of the Cold War, uh, an arms race between the US and the Soviet Union. Uh, and, uh, and, and there was a good deal of reason to feel somehow skeptical about the science that led to the creation of a weapon that could completely obliterate uh, human life as we know it on the planet. This is before the threat of climate change. This is before uh, uh, we realized that deterrence uh, as a method actually turned out to work. Uh, and of course it was before, <coughs> excuse me, a pandemic threatened uh, the world with very different kinds of uh, reasons to, to worry about uh, global forces that you can't see, not an atom that could be split but of course a pathogen that can uh, uh, be deadly just by breathing it into your body. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, I, I was always really, really interested uh, in how science worked. Uh, but the way in which I thought about science was from the point of view of people who wrote books about uh, the history of science, how, how scientific uh, discoveries have been made how the scientific method was established, uh, and ultimately uh, how scientific knowledge uh, comes, uh, comes into being. Uh, there was a book that um, uh, had been published 10 years before I was in college, but I read when I was in college by a man by the name of Thomas Kuhn, and it was called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it was a kind of revolutionary book itself. It made the argument that science operated under the kind of uh, conceptual framework of what he called a paradigm, a way of basically construing the world, of understanding the basic and fundamental uh, elements that then uh, would become the basis on which you would see how science could help you understand everything from matter to energy to uh, human life to cellular operations and so on and so forth. But Kuhn, focused on the Copernican revolution, uh, which was the, uh, the transformation that, uh, that, that, that was uh, imagined by Copernicus against uh, the standard uh, notion of uh, the Ptolemaic uh, view of the world in which the earth stood still and the sun 
revolved, revolved around the earth. But what Kuhn wrote in his book was that in the uh, early years of really looking at uh, the question of whether it was the sun or the earth that was doing all the moving and the revolving and, uh, and the like, there was not so much evidence that propelled uh, the Copernican point of view so much as a kind of insight, a sense that perhaps uh, it didn't, uh, uh, that having the earth stand still didn't explain all the phenomena that could be assembled to, uh, to, to bear on the question of, of, of the universe and uh, questions of uh, elementary motion in the universe. Uh, but it was years later that the Copernican insight was proved to be right. And it was really with, uh, with Galileo years later uh, who began to develop new laws of motion and gravity, uh, which of course were further developed by Isaac Newton uh, that, uh, that ultimately proved that that was the better way to understand the world and that in fact, the earth did not stand still. Uh, <clears throat> but even that was before uh, there were spaceships that could uh, 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 look at the earth revolving, et cetera, et cetera. So what Kuhn is uh, suggesting uh, in his in his work, and what really got uh, scientists chattering uh, uh, about during uh, the reception of that of, of that of that work, was the question of how how do you come to understand something that maybe fu uh, fundamentally changed the way you look at the world, uh, and do you do so through the standard scientific method? Now, the scientific method itself was. Uh, uh, not so much a, a five-step program that led from a hypothesis to an experiment or an observation to a conclusion, but a, a, a variety of different ways of thinking about how you try to gain knowledge about the world. Uh, it was only, in fact, in the early 20th century that, uh, uh, that, that in, in fact, somebody by the name of John Dewey, uh, a philosopher, not a scientist, taught at... Uh, Michigan and Chicago, and then for many years at Columbia, uh, wrote down the scientific method. And he, he, he basically gave it a kind of five-step uh, progression. But even later, uh, uh, he complained that what he had proposed as a kind of general argument about how certain kinds of scientific experiments might be made or observations might be made and how they will accumulate into knowledge, he was, he was concerned that it had been simplified. Uh, and of course, it was uh, then used in, in textbooks, and you've probably seen it in your own textbooks in, uh, in, in school, uh, to simplify what the scientific method actually is. In fact, of course, scientific knowledge comes from much more uh, serendipitous, <clears throat> different kinds of uh, 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 relationships to uh, everything from observation to experiment to the way you can develop a hypothesis. And so uh, ultimately, uh, you know, Dewey uh, kind of turned his back and said, no, I, I, I don't want to uh, uh, confirm this idea that the scientific method is a single thing. Uh, but what Kuhn, what Thomas Kuhn had done was to really bring this back to, uh, uh, to the point where there was a major conversation taking place about how uh, science came to know the world and what was the basis for the authority that science had. Uh, and there was a huge debate for decades, and in some ways it continues to the present day, uh, as to whether or not science is a single thing or whether science is in fact a human process uh, as constructed by social uh, uh, events, social processes, social contexts, uh, as any other form of knowledge. Now, why do I, why do I start with uh, some philosophical debates about science. I start because the truth is that whether I would have gone into the humanities or the sciences, had I not been educated at a time when the two uh, areas of knowledge had been so separated, uh, I might not have ever even thought in terms of this, uh, this, 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 uh, this, this kind of division uh, between what came to be called by C.P. Snow, and I'll come back to Snow in a second, uh, the two cultures. Uh, because we really are, in some respects, dealing with two cultures when we think about the humanities and the sciences, at least as they've been uh, uh, understood uh, and, uh, uh, and taught 
uh, and argued about uh, for, uh, for the last hundred years. Okay, so Schallander mentioned that my first teaching job was at the California Institute of Technology. Now you may think that's an odd place for a humanist to get uh, a job teaching, a historian who also uh, studied anthropology, who did indeed spend many, many, uh, 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 well, uh, spent three years or so uh, when I was doing my PhD, living in Chennai, living uh, in a small uh, town south of Chennai in Pudukorte, uh, doing research for my, uh, for my dissertation and then for my first book. But I was hired at Caltech, and I was hired because Caltech had what they called a core curriculum. And in that core curriculum, they insisted that students, whether they were studying theoretical physics or uh, biochemistry or engineering, had to take a set of courses in the humanities. And they didn't treat these courses as just add-ons. They taught them as fundamental. And I realized why when I first began to uh, go for lunch to the faculty club at Caltech. It's a famed, beautiful old faculty club that was built to bring people across different disciplines and departments on campus together. And there was a tradition where uh, there were some round tables in the, uh, in the club where you would go and sit down and you couldn't reserve a place and you had to simply sit down next to whoever was sitting there before you got there. First time I went, I sat next to Richard Feynman uh, and uh, next time I went, I sat next to uh, Murray Gelman, and, um, uh, and it turned out that the gentleman on the other side of the table on both occasions was Max Delbruck. Now, these were all luminary scientists. They all were, of course, Nobel laureates. Uh, and some of you have maybe even uh, uh, heard about uh, the, the physics lectures, the famous physics lectures of Richard Feynman. Uh, which are still available, uh, I'm sure uh, you can find them on the web. Uh, to me, uh, 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 Feynman was uh, not just a brilliant physicist, uh, but he was a, a wonderful communicator about science. And he was curious about everything. Uh, uh, he was also, it turned out, an amateur actor. So we actually acted together in a play at Caltech. But the point of the story is that in meeting these really great scientists, uh, I realized, you know, that um, uh, that this idea of the two cultures, this division of the way in which uh, different kinds of, of uh, departments and disciplines and questions had been uh, had been sorted uh, across the university, seemed pretty artificial. Uh, Feynman was interested in the origins of the universe, and he was interested in fundamental issues about cosmology. Murray Galman, uh, the inventor of the quark. Uh, also happened to be uh, extremely interested in early Indian philosophy and would ask me uh, uh, to, what to read on Nyaya logic and uh, uh, Advaita and um, uh, the Vaita forms of, uh, of, of philosophical uh, 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 discourse. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I came to realize that, you know, maybe there was a problem not so much uh, with science or with the humanities, but with the organization of the university. Now I'm going to fast forward uh, to, uh, uh, you know, I taught, I, 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 I wrote books, I did more research in India. Uh, I had um, uh, an opportunity to move at some point to the University of Michigan, which I, uh, which I did. Uh, and I, you know, uh, uh, developed my, uh, my work in, in the his history and anthropology of India. I worked on caste and I worked on the history of the caste system. But when I uh, went to Columbia, uh, I was asked by uh, the president to become the dean of the arts and sciences. And of course, in a, in a way, my first question is, uh, what are the arts and sciences? In American universities, uh, many, uh, uh, many universities are organized around uh, uh, professional schools, schools of law, schools of medicine, sometimes schools of business, and then what are called the core, uh, uh, the core disciplines, which are all grouped within the arts and sciences. And sometimes it's called literature and science. Sometimes it's called literature, science, and the arts, as it was at the University of Michigan. But if you go back uh, uh, effectively to the history of the term, uh, the more general uh, uh, term that's used or, or, or rubric that's used 
for disciplines that range from literature and philosophy to chemistry and physics with uh, economics and psychology and, and history in between uh, go by the general uh, rubric of arts and sciences. And, uh, uh, and so uh, as the Dean of the Arts and Sciences, and uh, you know, Jamshed can, can talk about this, he also had that, that, that same uh, position uh, before he went on to become a provost at Tufts. And, um, uh, and, and, and the question is, what, what are the arts and sciences? Well, it's, uh, it's all these different disciplines, as I said. Uh, and in the case of Columbia, there were 29 departments. So when I was appointed, I replaced a uh, dean who had been a, uh, a, a, he'd been a, a molecular biologist and neuroscientist. And initially, the science chairs were all very concerned. Uh, they, they thought, you know, how could a historian and anthropologist understand anything? about the needs of chemistry and physics. And it is true. The needs of chemistry and physics are very different than the needs of, say, a chair of anthropology or a chair of history. To hire a new chemist, you have to build a laboratory or you have to refurbish a laboratory and you have to get equipment and you have to organize all kinds of things that make it possible for that scientist to come into the university, <clears throat> establish the laboratory uh, that will pursue the research uh, upon which she or he is working, uh, and then build the case for getting support from other sources uh, to fund that research going forward because the university uh, can't uh, hire all the, uh, all the postdocs and uh, buy all the equipment that's needed for uh, scientific research that is incredibly expensive and incredibly difficult to do without a lot of infrastructure. So these scientists came and asked me uh, if I even had a clue what it meant to hire somebody in these fields. And of course I had to uh, learn on the job and uh, learn I did because they came with many proposals to hire wonderful people. Uh, and, uh, and it was in the course of uh, close to 10 years uh, in that role uh, that I came to indeed appreciate the fact that in terms of how faculty live their lives, the sciences and, and, and the arts sometimes seem very, very different. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and they're very different ways in which uh, you need to fund, to organize uh, uh, departments, et cetera. At the same time, what I found uh, unfortunate was that in a big research university, uh, it was too easy for faculty to live their lives inside single departments. And, instead of seeking out the proverbial round table at the faculty club where you can actually sit and engage in an extraordinary, extraordinarily fascinating conversation with colleagues, but colleagues from very different places, you tend to spend your life inside a department and, uh, and just talk about uh, different points of view within the department. And unfortunately, sometimes there are major disagreements even within single disciplines or single departments, and that can be uh, uh, almost uh, 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 seem uh, more important or more uh, preoccupying uh, than the larger intellectual questions that, uh, that really are, uh, uh, are there, but there only if you ask, uh, there for the asking as the phrase goes. And so I, I began to think more broadly about how do you create the, 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 the structures uh, within the university to allow uh, the kind of intellectual life uh, to take place uh, in a way that will communicate itself not only to fellow faculty, but most importantly, to students. How can one, uh, in fact, uh, provide the kind of education that's needed? And I began to think more and more and more about this, and I'll say a bit more in a few minutes about why it is that it is a huge disservice to students to think that particularly undergraduate students should be trained uh, almost uh, the same way that PhD students are uh, in particular uh, disciplinary tracks with the idea that all they need to know is to basically uh, learn what it would take to get a PhD in a particular field. Is that really adequate? And in any event, does it, uh, does it really come to grips with uh, the kind of knowledge that we're dealing with in the world in the 21st century? 
Because after all, most of the disciplines, most of the departments that uh, still exist within most research universities, for that matter, most colleges and universities, not just in the United States, but around the world, were set up in the late 19th century, a very long time ago, when knowledge was in a very different state uh, and, uh, and, and, and dealing with a very different world. So um, uh, uh, I, I'm, 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 I began to think even in that context uh, about the question of the two cultures. Uh, and I went back and read uh, a book that was written on the basis of a, uh, uh, of a lecture that had been given uh, in England uh, uh, called the Reed Lectures in 1959. Uh, and it had been given, and I mentioned his name before, by uh, C.P. Snow. Uh, he, he's the one who really invented this idea of the two cultures. That, and his, his, his idea was that uh, the humanities and the sciences occupy not just different parts of the campus or the quads, but two distinct cultures of inquiry and understanding. Now, C.P. Snow himself, who was he? He was in fact a trained scientist and had uh, done biological research, not all of which had worked out. He uh, in fact uh, was following on a uh, particular uh, subject that turned out not to, not to lead to uh, the kinds of results that, uh, that allowed him to continue. Uh, and so he quit and he actually decided since he was a very good writer as well as researcher to become a novelist. Uh, and he did. He wrote uh, very popular novels in, 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 in Britain in the post-war period and, um, and, 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 and then decided to uh, reflect about uh, the kind of divide in his own life between his work uh, initially as a trained scientist and then his work later uh, as a writer. Uh, and he became increasingly concerned that although he loved novels and he thought novels allowed him to explore the depths of human meaning and human life and, uh, and some of the fundamental questions, sometimes what he called the kind of tragedy of human life, uh, that in fact, there was a tendency at that point anyway in the UK for uh, people in universities to think the humanities were so much more important than the sciences when the sciences would be necessary uh, to deal with the fact that uh, there was poverty around the world, there were issues that had to be dealt with, and that technology would be required and science would be needed uh, to create uh, a better economy, uh, to create better medicine, better uh, public health, uh, and indeed to create the technological wherewithal for progress to be made across the world and all the kinds of things that challenge the world. And of course, the UK was still reeling in some ways from the uh, devastation of, of World War II. Uh, but he complained about the fact that at that point, the humanities were um, in the ascendant uh, and the sciences didn't have a great deal of prestige and authority. Now, it's interesting for me to look back on that uh, because of course, um, today you could say uh, things have turned uh, full table and uh, now uh, the humanities are in a crisis. Uh, and increasingly, uh, uh, certainly in, in the United States, many people are saying, well, you know, we don't really need to educate students in the humanities and the arts anymore. That they're irrelevant. They won't give people a job. They're jokes about English majors who uh, 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 are in, much in debt because they've, uh, they've gone to college and they've gotten a degree in English or literature. And uh, it's not going to give them a job at Google or Apple or Facebook. Uh, and, um, and, and, and yet, uh, uh, so I, but I, I, and yet C.P. Snow had some very interesting uh, things to say because he felt that, uh, that closing the gap uh, between uh, these two cultures of the arts and sciences was important from both sides, as important for, uh, 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 for the scientists to understand fundamental questions from the humanities as it was for the humanists to understand fundamental questions from the sciences. And, uh, and he felt that there was a, 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 a real need uh, to develop a, a much broader kind of literacy, a kind of intellectual equivalent of what he called bilingualism, 
uh, to, uh, to attend to, to learn from, and to contribute to wider conversations uh, that required both the arts and, and the sciences. And, and, and what Snow uh, referenced, and what I was referencing myself uh, back when I was talking about uh, Thomas Kuhn and John Dewey, is the fact that if you actually look back on the history of science, or the history of knowledge for that matter, uh, the arts and the sciences were not, in fact, two cultures until very, very recently, really until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Before then, you, you would be hard pressed uh, to find a scientist who would say they had no interest in, in arts or literature or philosophy. Philosophers <laughs> were interested in the natural world uh, and didn't see any problem with their, uh, their, with their philosophical uh, discipline taking them uh, into, uh, into a study of, uh, of, of, the natural, of the natural world. Uh, and indeed, if you look even at, say, some of the great scientific uh, uh, breakthroughs, uh, not of uh, uh, Copernicus or, or, or Galileo or Newton, but more recently of someone like Darwin, uh, you find somebody uh, who certainly didn't uh, have the capacity to use a scientific method. After all, it was hard to experiment uh, on the ancient history of, uh, of the world, of evolution, of natural selection. Uh, but you had uh, a, a genuinely Renaissance kind of intellectual uh, figure who uh, put together uh, 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 different artifacts from his travels around the world, famously from his uh, voyage on the Beagle on the ship, uh, to, uh, to develop a, a sense of, uh, of, of, of natural history based on classification, but also as much on speculation about potential connections between and among uh, different mollusks or different uh, uh, other kinds of fossils or, or other, uh, uh, other things that he could collect uh, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, different, uh, uh, different animals and, uh, and, and, and animals that were distributed around the world in different ways. He, 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 he put this together using extraordinary intellectual power, but power that could never be seen as solely about the sciences or the arts. Uh, and if you uh, look at a biography of Darwin, you'll see how much of a kind of Renaissance man he is. And in that sense, I use Renaissance simply to mean somebody who was interested in everything. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so if, if you look even at this extraordinary transformation, as it were, of our understanding of the world uh, that came from the work of Darwin, and of course, many others who then developed uh, the theory of natural selection, You'll see it's hard to uh, really justify the fact that uh, the sciences and the humanities have been separated out as distinct areas of, of knowledge and inquiry. Uh, now, of course, uh, what happened with Darwin's ideas is they generated immense reaction. Uh, in the United States, uh, there were uh, uh, trials that took place over the teaching of evolution. There were all kinds of, uh, of religious figures who found natural selection to be uh, just uh, anathema. Uh, there were complaints, of course, that uh, it was uh, against the Bible and against uh, uh, religious truth to claim that man might have evolved from the apes. Uh, and in a curious way, uh, even though Darwin's work emerged out of the union of the arts and sciences, uh, his work in turn created uh, a real uh, uh, sense of a divide between those who believed as it were in science and those who believed in religious knowledge and religious truth. And to some extent, Darwin's ideas uh, did in the 20th century become the basis on which uh, a real cleavage uh, developed. It wasn't the cleavage of the arts and sciences on the university campus, but it was increasingly the basis on which uh, uh, you had people who were wondering if you could either, uh, if you could be religious and scientific at the same time. Uh, so, so this, this was a, uh, uh, a kind of uh, a precipitating moment, but it then fed into a lot of other kinds of, uh, of questions and issues. And, uh, and as I said before, this is a time when the ideas of science were being uh, were being uh, 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 formalized uh, into these notions of a scientific method that was being taught in schools. But then again, 
uh, there was a great deal of contestation. I say this because the academic issue that I've been talking about, the divide between the arts and the sciences, uh, is of course a problem uh, and an issue to be, I think, resisted in the university. And again, uh, I'll, I'll return to this uh, later when I talk a little bit about some of the things that, that I tried to do <clears throat> as a university administrator. But it turns out that it's a kind of uh, 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 issue that affects all of us uh, much more broadly as well. Uh, because after all, uh, we are living now in a major world pandemic in which uh, uh, questions of science, scientific authority, uh, religion, or sometimes things that aren't so much religion, but just uh, skepticism about science itself, uh, uh, are some of the most uh, perdurant uh, uh, obstacles uh, to actually dealing with uh, this, uh, this, this COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we've all been living through. Uh, there is a huge uh, uh, resistance uh, to science, to scientific knowledge, to expertise. Uh, and, uh, and so we've seen that whether it's resistance to wearing masks or to social distancing or fear about irrational fear about taking uh, a vaccine, that these issues of, uh, of, of, the, of the nature of, of, of scientific knowledge and the uh, authority that is conferred on scientific knowledge uh, uh, are, 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 are permeating virtually every part uh, of, our, uh, of our lives. Uh, and so, so this is a, a, a way of saying that I think uh, uh, what we are dealing with when we're talking about whether one should be studying just science or just computer science uh, or just humanities and philosophy and literature, uh, we're actually uh, uh, talking about very big issues because the education we get uh, and the kind of knowledge that we receive, even in our first year in college, which is where uh, uh, most of you are uh, at this point in your lives, uh, will have consequences and will, uh, will, will radiate out across your lifetimes and across also much of your, uh, uh, your life and work well beyond college, well beyond the university, well beyond your formal education, uh, uh, because these are in fact some of the fundamental questions of our time. Um, technology, can we allow technology as it were to solely develop on its own without there being some set of ethical, moral, um, uh, economic, uh, cultural, political concerns brought to bear on how we use technology? That goes back, of course, to uh, what I was talking about before in relationship to my own concern about uh, uh, nuclear fission and then the use of nuclear fission for, uh, for weapons as opposed to, for example, for energy. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not just about a pandemic. When we think about this, uh, we obviously also are experiencing across the world now uh, increasingly visible evidence that climate change is real, dramatic uh, and, uh, and, and potentially threatening, uh, not just uh, uh, in the form of, uh, of worse weather, uh, but in, uh, in forms of uh, not just weather, but uh, natural uh, conditions that will affect everything from food security to the viability of life uh, uh, in, in, in coastal cities, uh, to in fact, the uh, capacity of human beings to live uh, on a planet that is heating uh, at a rate that uh, uh, is, 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 gen is truly, truly frightening and, uh, uh, and potentially devastating. So what, that, uh, uh, what all of this uh, uh, raises, of course, is what to do if there is a substantial number of people in the world for whom climate change is, uh, is simply um, a hoax, uh, 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 um, in, in which the in which the scientific knowledge and the scientific expertise that is brought to bear on the data that we're, uh, that we're understanding better and better, and of course, seeing more and more, uh, what happens when that uh, becomes uh, something that is simply discounted by, uh, by a great many people for whom climate change is just another uh, 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 effort on the part of a, uh, of a coastal elite to, uh, uh, to spend money on things that don't really uh, 
affect my life or, if it, or, or, or worse than that will make my life even worse than it already is. So, uh, so all, of these, uh, all of these questions around uh, the resistance, uh, uh, the skepticism, uh, the, the, the kind of disregard for, uh, and sometimes outright rejection of scientific knowledge uh, is, is, is also part of this, of this, of this question about how we, how we are educated and how we think about uh, the real questions that we're gonna have to take on going, going forward. Um, so, uh, and, and, and again, I, I, I mentioned this uh, uh, in passing, but, uh, but in, a, in, a, in a curious way right now, the crisis of the humanities in many universities or in society more generally, or the crisis of the liberal arts, is a crisis that, that I think will have uh, a great deal of bearing, not just on the fields in the humanities, not just on people who've been trained to teach courses in the areas that I do, but really uh, at the core of the sciences as well, because the success of science in, uh, uh, in developing approaches to the use of technology, to the uh, way we deal with climate change, to uh, the ways we can respond to future pandemics, to uh, new pathogens, to new th threats that are, uh, that are potentially uh, uh, even more lethal uh, than COVID-19, uh, is in fact, uh, I, I'm, I'm suggesting here today, uh, based on, uh, on, on things that uh, go well beyond the formal uh, dictates of the scientific method of a particular scientific lab or scientific bench, uh, and in which uh, uh, scientists and non-scientists need to work together uh, from beginning uh, to end on every kind of project uh, that they're working on. So I want to give, um, in, in, a, in the few more minutes that I'll be speaking, I want to give a, a few examples of things that I have uh, participated in or done or uh, encouraged uh, in, uh, in my life as an academic administrator. Uh, and then uh, uh, open things up for, uh, for comments and, and questions uh, from you. Uh, but again, just before I, I, I do this, I, I go back to my, uh, to my freshman seminar. And I remember uh, uh, that those wonderful debates I heard about uh, philosophy on the one hand and behavioral, behaviorism on the other, uh, what that did is it, it, it opened up a world for me. And it opened up a world that, um, uh, uh, just, just, just. Can you hang on for for two seconds? Yeah, you can. Just, I, the, um, just, give me, just give me just two minutes, please. There are two professors in our apartment, and uh, <laughs> and our yeah. microwave is in my study, so uh, which is also our dining room. Uh, but um, we might as well then introduce the other professor who is going to be speaking late. I'm sorry. Hi, Janaki. Hi. <laughs> the the the, oh, the camera is the there. Camera's there. Hi. Who am I saying hi to? Shailinder is there, Hi, Jamshed is there, Hi, lots, of, lots of friends, lots of friends. You, Hello, I'm being... going to see you all in a little while, I think. Yes? Yes, <laughs> later on the semester, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. I'm getting out of your way in four yeah. seconds. Sorry, COVID has, has made for some unusual walking arrangements. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, yeah. So just, uh, so I'll now, uh, I'll continue to, um, uh, to conclude the formal parts of my remarks and then I wanna open things up for questions. But as I was just saying, I, 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 I think back to my freshman seminar and, and, and the way in which the engagement of, uh, of people from these different uh, disciplines and backgrounds and orientations uh, was presented to me. And I realized that that's, Ultimately, the kind of uh, the kind of education that uh, really did prepare me uh, for thinking about these broader issues across a lifetime, uh, not just within the university, but now uh, uh, now within the New York Academy of Sciences, where we are dealing with questions of how you communicate science better to a broader public, 
how you uh, do convey the authority of science to people who uh, uh, um, have an irrational fear of a vaccine uh, or how one uh, is able to, uh, to, at the same time that one is talking about science, uh, uh, also uh, uh, be able to say, you know, science is a funny thing. It doesn't just begin with a single uh, truth. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people who uh, will claim that um, uh, the task uh, for all of us uh, today and for people in, say, the political world uh, is to follow the science. But the problem is the science changes. Uh, and one of the things that we've seen in the current pandemic is that the science is actually changing in real time. Uh, it's one thing to, uh, to, to, to talk about something that has been uh, studied over the course of many years, but we began studying COVID-19 in November of 2019, and actually we only began to understand it at all in January and February of 2020. And so many of our understandings uh, have changed uh, radically over the course of the last 18 months. Uh, initially, uh, everybody was uh, wiping off surfaces and uh, spraying um, uh, and, uh, isopropyl alcohol on, uh, on, on tables and even bags of uh, groceries that one would bring in from the store, only to realize that it was an aerosol-based uh, uh, and transmitted pathogen and that masks were much more important than having bottles of isopropyl alcohol. Uh, ideas about uh, even from that, uh, uh, what the uh, what kind of vaccine to, to uh, that would work with this? Uh, the use of mRNA for developing an extraordinary vaccine, but then of course, more recently, the fact that the vaccine doesn't protect you from any infection; it just typically in, uh, protects you from uh, from serious uh, uh, disease uh, is something that for many people is profoundly destabilizing, and uh, and so. A lot of people who were skeptical about science before the pandemic, ironically, given the extraordinary accomplishment of identifying the pathogen, creating a vaccine, creating a vaccine that works so well, uh, and disseminated it to so many people, although, of course, it's still globally uh, not nearly disseminated wide, uh, widely enough. But with all of that uh, success, there are many people who are more skeptical about science than they have ever been before. Uh, and so uh, it's a uh, it's a huge struggle to uh, to try to deal with these questions, uh, and that's one of the core things that we do at the New York Academy of Sciences. Since we're interested in the relationship of science and the public good, uh, science and the public and the public sphere. Uh, but um, uh, but let me let me go back to uh, uh, to the university uh, and what kinds of things I uh, have tried to do. To, uh, uh, to, to engage uh, uh, this, this problem of bringing the two cultures closer uh, to each other. Um, I'll, I'll give one example that, uh, that Vice Chancellor uh, Barucha can actually uh, uh, appreciate and also say much, much more about than I can, uh, since he's a, a, a neuroscientist, I, I'm not. But, um, but we had a, a, a small group uh, at Berkeley of people who worked in, uh, in neuroscience. And the first decision I made when I uh, became the chancellor was to invest in that group uh, and to try to build it up and give it the resources it needed because what it had was uh, a group of biologists on the one side or biologists and, psych and cognitive psychologists on the one side and people in the engineering school on the other. And one of the things they were able to do was to de develop new forms of imaging that were uh, really uh, um, uh, created by virtue of the kind of expertise that came out of engineering. Uh, but, the, uh, but, but, but some of the engineering, uh, some of the imaging uh, done in particular by a professor by the name of Professor Jack Gallant uh, required a thorough understanding of, uh, of, of, of brain function. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and an engagement with the ways in which he was thinking about how uh, memories are uh, recorded in the brain. Uh, and so uh, it was the interchange between the engineers and the uh, cognitive psychologists and biologists that really made what was a fairly small boutique group so powerful 
Uh, and it was uh, uh, not just powerful, it was also incredibly flexible. Uh, and there was a moment when we uh, had a donor who came along who was interested actually in uh, connecting the work of neuroscience to an interest that this donor had in Buddhist meditation. And unlike many other neuroscience groups that uh, might have said, oh, I'm not sure about that, uh, this group uh, was able <coughs> and willing to take it on. So it was, it was really through its cross-disciplinary connection uh, that we're uh, uh, able to not only think about uh, just, you know, the question of how you get a better image of, of, of the brain, uh, but also what does it mean to talk about memory? What does it mean to talk about uh, uh, consciousness? Uh, what does it mean to even think potentially about uh, the physics of meditation? It's just, just one little example. Um, but uh, what I spent a great deal more time doing was working on developing a new way of, of doing data science. Uh, uh, we had students who were just flocking to take courses in computer science. Every Berkeley student uh, thought that if they could take a course in computer science, they could immediately get a job. Uh, and I mentioned this <coughs> before in, in Facebook or Google or, uh, or Apple. Uh, and it was interesting because uh, even though uh, that flood of students was headed in that one direction, I was talking to people from those uh, technology companies and many of them were saying, you know, what we really want uh, are um, graduates uh, from Berkeley who can come in and think differently about the world. Uh, uh, students who have, uh, yeah, they need to have some kind of uh, core computational understanding and expertise, but they also have to be able to think and to write and to critique uh, they have to be able to even imagine a very different uh, way in which technology might interface with uh, individuals or with society. Uh, and so, yeah, we're interested in, uh, in graduates, but we're interested in graduates who have a very broad educational background and perform as well in courses in the humanities as they do in courses in computer science. Now, that's not why we did what we did, but it was a real confirmation uh, and validation uh, for what we thought uh, we could do at Berkeley, partly because we couldn't just build computer science. So we created a new core course in data analytics. And, uh, and then what we did is we created a whole bunch of what we call plug-in courses that uh, effectively allowed students from all over the university to do data analytics around data that came from their own field of study. For example, there were many students who were doing this work from the public health school and they were working on epidemiology. And this was of course before uh, COVID, but they were working on Zika virus and trying to figure out why it was and how it was that the Zika virus was moving around and all, even the kind of relationship between Zika and dengue fever, which both of which are mosquito borne uh, diseases that uh, share a lot in common in, in the way in which uh, 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 their, their etiology works and, um, and their transmission works. Uh, and so you could take public health students and, and they, could, they, could do, uh, uh, they could do this course in data analytics, but do it, of course, with data that made sense for them and for the program that they were, <coughs> that they were in. Uh, by the same token, you could have students from literature. You could have students who were interested in the authorship of a Shakespeare play, uh, and they could put a lot of data in and do an analytical uh, uh, study and um, come out with different ways of thinking about authorship. Uh, and they were able to do this uh, 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 while also learning uh, all kinds of things about how you how you operate with data while, uh, while still uh, enjoying and um, exploring the depth of, uh, of Shakespeare's uh, uh, literary power. Uh, you had students in history who could look at uh, mortality data uh, around um, earlier pandemics. In fact, uh, uh, again, I keep coming back to pandemics, but this was one of the examples that we used in a course uh, to look at the Black Death and, uh, and, and how that affected history. Uh, and of course that was a much more deadly uh, 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 plague than, uh, than COVID. So this, uh, this, this single course with a, with, a, with a new way of connecting courses across the curriculum uh, 
ultimately has now led to the creation of a new division of data science. But it's a division that is not a separation, but it's simply a place where uh, these kinds of courses are organized and connected uh, across the curriculum. It's more of a kind of network model uh, than a discrete uh, uh, disciplinary or department model. Uh, and so, uh, so I think that's a, that, that was an example of how I tried to uh, bring together uh, the, two, the two cultures. Um, when you think about technology, you also think about all the other issues that of course have begun to become uh, uh, seen as so, uh, so important and so, uh, so necessary to confront and deal with uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, in machine learning, for example. Uh, you realize, uh, people have begun to realize that, <laughs> that the algorithms that uh, we used to think were just neutral, uh, 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 neutral ways of organizing data are no more neutral than any other kind of text. Uh, and that even when they're designed without any intention, for example, to introduce bias, they do so both because of unconscious bias and because they encode social biases through analyzing large data sets from the outside world that of course, uh, 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 where there is a great deal of bias. So, um, uh, so the, the, another thing that we, that we tried to work on was, uh, was ensuring that, uh, that everyone who was writing algorithms was engaged in a rigorous uh, critical interrogation of the kinds of biases that were being uh, built into, uh, into the algorithms that were being used. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this question that is now sometimes called algorithmic uh, justice uh, is fundamental, uh, not just to efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but really I think any, uh, any, any undertaking uh, uh, in, uh, in coding uh, where, uh, where we have to be aware of, uh, of the complexity uh, of, of using uh, digital means to, to analyze social uh, reality. Social reality, uh, of course, uh, is complex, whatever the method is that one uses or approach that, that one engages. Um, so uh, um, another example, uh, again, I'm sure uh, some of you have read a lot about this, but in philosophy departments, uh, there uh, uh, was a, a whole set of, uh, of, of, of uh, models that were used to, or examples that were used to talk about some of the big puzzles in moral philosophy and ethical philosophy. Uh, and they came to be called for historical reasons, the trolley problem. Uh, now the trolley problem uh, 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 refers to a host of thought experiments that pose questions uh, uh, around how to choose, should you be the host, uh, I'm sorry, should you be the conductor of a trolley? And a trolley is you know, a, single, uh, a single train carriage that is uh, uh, going down a track. Um, uh, and why it's a trolley, I don't exactly know, but it had to do with, uh, I suppose, uh, the time period when uh, this uh, example began to be used a lot in, uh, in, 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 in philosophical debates. Uh, but, uh, but the question was, if you're a conductor of a trolley and you have, you're going down a track and you can either, uh, and the track splits and you have a choice between hitting one person uh, uh, on the left who may be young and say three people who are much older on the right, what would you do? Would you flip the switch would you simply say, okay, I'm going to let fate uh, di dictate uh, uh, what I'm going to do? Um, uh, you have a limited set of choices and you have to actually take on the larger philosophical question of whether one young life is equivalent to three older lives where people have lived most of their lives uh, as opposed to someone who has only, but three opposed to one. Where's the equivalence there? How do you think about that as a moral question? Uh, and what would you do if you were confronted with that choice? Now, one of the reasons you take a trolley is of course, because uh, you have a track that is clearly defined uh, and the choice uh, is not one that uh, involves, uh, you know, what would be uh, 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 perhaps uh, 
brought into a discussion around the car where you might be able to uh, veer off, hit a tree and kill yourself as opposed to somebody on the, on the highway in front of you. But again, the point is not about the, exa the, the example. The point is that uh, these are fundamental questions in, in, in moral philosophy that, uh, that philosophers have thought about a lot uh, over the years. Now, uh, uh, this is not just a philosophical question. Uh, because we uh, now, of course, are uh, seeing autonomous vehicles that are being programmed, uh, that are being programmed to drive on roads. Uh, and there are real questions, just like the trolley problem, about how you would set up the coding for how the car would decide what to do in the event that it had a choice between killing the driver or, uh, again, these uh, populations of individuals who could be sorted in terms of age or uh, uh, some other demographic characteristic, uh, and yet uh, uh, in which these are not mere philosophical puzzles, but actually real life probabilities given uh, what happens on roads where you have uh, some residual level of uncertainty about the outcome of any given uh, time on the road. So, uh, so, so, so the reason I raise this here is because you think you're just going to be training students to be coders, uh, and suppose they go and work for, uh, you know, for a, a a car company, and pretty soon they're writing code for an autonomous vehicle. Um, wouldn't it be better if they'd actually uh, thought about the moral and ethical issues uh, before they were doing the coding, uh, rather than uh, simply throw their hands up and say, "I I can't I can't deal with these questions. I've never seen them before. I just write code." Um, some other example, uh, uh, ex and these are things that that that, that Berkeley, uh, when I taught there, was dealing with because there was a whole wing in its Center for Transportation uh, that was actually working on these questions around uh, around coding for autonomous vehicles, uh, where some of the, in fact, Berkeley was one where some of the first autonomous vehicles were ever experimented with uh, about 20, uh, 25 years ago. Um, uh, questions of ethics. Uh, uh, exist everywhere, not just uh, when you're thinking about uh, vehicles or autonomous uh, vehicles. What about CRISPR-Cas9? Uh, one of the great uh, 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 pleasures of my time at Berkeley was to work with and help support Jennifer Doudna, professor of molecular and cell biology, who of course won the Nobel Prize uh, in, uh, uh, in, in medicine this last year. And she won it uh, for her path-breaking research on CRISPR-Cas9 uh, that, she, that she did at Berkeley. And uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is, of course, a form of uh, gene editing using uh, to human RNA that um, can snip out a, a, single, uh, a single gene uh, and potentially heal diseases, uh, uh, cure diseases like uh, Huntington's disease, which is genetically transmitted. It can do other things too. It, CRISPR-Cas9 could potentially uh, select for genes that uh, give you um, uh, 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 give you a certain kind of height or uh, athletic physique or hair color. Uh, leave alone uh, uh, other kinds of medical conditions. And as you begin to uh, and and as 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 Professor Doudna began to think about what gene editing could be used to do uh, very shortly after she actually developed the technique for doing this, she began to think about what the ethics involved in those kinds of operations might be. She convened a group with another uh, Nobel laureate, David Baltimore and others, to draw up some guidelines around how you might, uh, how scientists might think about uh, the use of CRISPR-Cas9. But of course, the point is that many of these scientists had never thought about these issues very much before. Uh, and of course, there was a famous case of a, of a scientist in Shenzhen, uh, China, who used uh, gene editing uh, in what he thought would be a humane way uh, to cut out genes that were associated with the transmission of, uh, of, of, uh, of HIV from mother to child. But uh, he did so without any uh, understanding of the potential uh, uh, um, negative effects of uh, that kind of extensive uh, 
uh, gene editing and, uh, and actually was as, and, and continues to serve time in, in prison as a result. What is my point? My point again is that uh, if you don't have uh, a, a strong background in some of the kinds of philosophical, legal, moral, ethical questions that relate to uh, the applications of science, uh, you're going to be very quickly put in a, comp in a situation where you are simply unable to do the science itself. So, uh, so those, are, um, those are all just a few examples of real life administrative uh, uh, efforts I made uh, to bring the humanities and the, and the sciences together. And I, I'm, I'm just talking about this with a very broad brush uh, because you're at the beginning of the seminar. Uh, uh, perhaps sometime we can come back and talk about the actual uh, particular issues that might uh, be brought uh, to bear in thinking about uh, the question of gene editing. For any of you who have access to uh, a, a wonderful book by Walter Isaacson about uh, gene editing and, uh, and, and, and CRISPR-Cas9 and Jennifer Doudna, for example, uh, you can see <laughs> chapters about, about the uh, ethical and moral uh, issues at the end. Uh, and that would be a great uh, seminar to have where we could talk through uh, what you think the guidelines might be uh, for those kinds of uh, scientific interventions. Uh, but again, uh, uh, whether you're talking about algorithms, whether you're talking about coding, whether you're talking about autonomous vehicles, whether you're talking about any number of things, including climate change, uh, it turns out the division of the arts and the sciences is not well suited for the challenges of our time. So the, that, that's really what I wanted to, uh, to, to convey in a kind of general sense. And what I'd like to do now, with your permission, uh, is to open uh, uh, the screen to, uh, to comments, uh, questions, provocations, uh, suggestions, uh, and, uh, and further conversation about, uh, about the kind of education, perhaps, that you are embarking on and why I think it is so fundamental, so critical, uh, and so important, uh, not just to have a top-rated university doing these kinds of things, but to do them in ways that really do change the, uh, uh, the, the, the fundamental assumptions about what an education should be uh, for uh, all of us uh, in a 21st century in which we're dealing with these kinds of global challenges, in which science is part of everything that we do, but in which science alone is, uh, is simply not equipped uh, to, to, to deal uh, with these challenges as we're confronting them. So Shailander, I'll turn things uh, Great. Uh, back to close the conversation. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Professor Dutz. Uh, always uh, felt I've learned a lot every time I've heard you speak. Uh, today was no exception.